Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, welcome to this inaugural Calgary chapter of Capitalism and Morality. Thank you, Darcy Garo and Clayton Reader for making this seminar in Calgary happen. India recently became the most populous country on the planet. It has today 1.4 billion people which means that one out of every 5.5 people on the planet is an Indian. Canada brings in by far the most immigrants from India. As a share of total immigrants, India's continues to increase by every passing year. It is incumbent, therefore, upon you to understand the Indian culture and what is happening here. I'm going to start with um, uh, certain statements and images and videos uh, of uh, uh, Western bureaucrats, Western media and Western corporations about their perception of what India is like. Or at least I, I want to show what their claimed perception of India is. Apple recently opened its first shop in India, in Mumbai, and soon thereafter in New Delhi. The result of which was that CNN reported that everyone in business loves India these days. Army fundamentally has really turned a corner. There's something going on in India in terms of industrialization, manufacturing coming back that over uh, kind of a, 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 you know beyond the near term de uh, mm. a, a slowdown. Really, we're looking at very solid fundamentals. Why do you think that is? That, that's a very that's a very big story that a lot of people have started to talk about industrial based manufacturing capacity. Why do you think that is, and does that continue? It's a big story, and I would argue one of the biggest stories in Asia right now. I've been following. Asia for decades and it was always that India was services led, services export, services doing very, very well, but the manufacturing sector mm. underperformed. But in India's state, uh, stage of development, you need manufacturing come in to create those jobs and that's happening. That's suddenly happening because of the China plus one strategy, right? It's about foreign investment and it's about some of the local reforms that uh, the administration has delivered. And suddenly you see kind of the green shoots on, on, on manufacturing development. If they can sustain that, then India is really in play for one of the biggest uh, 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 powerhouses uh, in, in the world, frankly, on manufacturing, if they play their cards right. First of all, I must say, this is a cartoon that has been published in a weekly, in a, in a, in a German weekly. Uh, like in India, Germany has uh, freedom of speech and freedom of press, so basically it's not up to me to comment. But if you want to have my personal view, I must say the, the, the cartoon was neither funny nor appropriate. It plays with very old-fashioned cliches, and um, I would like to invite this cartoonist to come on a metro ride with me in Delhi. Delhi has a metro which is so state-of-the-art that I think many, many metros in Germany are not as good as Delhi metro. And the same is valid for the train system. So I think um, he should inquire a bit more about India and, and know how, how state-of-the-art the, the railway system is. This is the cartoon that the German envoy was complaining about. A cartoon that I thought was extremely perceptive and showed a very good reality of life in India and a good comparison of India and China. Now let me uh, address the German envoy to India. He said uh, that come and travel in a metro in New Delhi. Now he should have bothered uh, going out of New Delhi just 20 kilometers outside New Delhi to really understand what India is like. There's virtually no public transportation in that country. Um, metros are rare, and when the capital city gets subsidized, metros paid off by the rest of the country, uh, that does not represent the country. If he really wants to uh, test out uh, other suburban railways, uh, he should try one in Mumbai, the most wealthy city in India. And let me show you a video of uh, a train service in Mumbai, uh, exactly the reason why I never ever take a train or any kind of public transportation except for flights. 
opportunity to spend more than an hour and a half with Prime Minister Modi, uh, who is, I don't need to tell anyone here, he is, he is the most popular world leader for a reason. He is unbelievable, visionary, visionary, and the, his level of commitment to the people of India is uh, just indescribable and deep and passionate and real and authentic and his desire to lift people out of poverty and move India forward uh, as a global power is real, and it is happening. But the best part of the meeting for me was this. Anyone who knows Prime Minister Modi, all of you knows, he is a tech guy, and he is deep into the details. So I found myself at his home at 7.30 on a Friday night talking about the details of, of radio access networks and artificial intelligence, and it was just amazing. And I said to him, and I'll say this to you, in the years to come, there will be two ecosystems of technology, one consistent with our democratic values and another not. And I said to him, the United States and India need to lead the, lead the world together in this technology ecosystem. And without missing a beat, after he had traveled all week, he said to me, well, Secretary, AI doesn't stand for artificial intelligence. I said, really? He said, AI is America, India technology ecosystem. Now, I don't understand what was happening in the mind of Gina Raimondo and what the motivations of the U.S. government is here in her speech. But the fact remains that she did not release that the speech that they gave, she gave in India to the American audience because American audience would have immediately sensed a rat there. I don't really fully understand what is she trying to achieve there. But if anyone is still harbors a view that India can ex accept manufacturing moving out of China, if that at all ever happens, my suggestion is don't bother. The two countries are not comparable. But clearly, Gina is lying. She, she is either clueless, either stupid, or she is just plain lying. The problem with you is that you as citizens of North America are getting misguided by these corporations because they want to get business from India or they want to prove something to the Wall Street and these bureaucrats, American bureaucrats or Canadian bureaucrats and politicians who want to gain some favor from Modi, you are getting fooled. Before uh, immigrating to Canada, I had set up Indian operations of two European companies. This was, of course, uh, more than two decades back. While most of my career since immigrating to Canada has been in the resources sector, uh, I have also advised uh, multi-billion dollar companies on 
investing in India. To most of those companies, uh, my usual summary details and conclusion is don't bother. The reason is that the reason I left India was because I was sick and tired of corruption and dysfunctionality in that country. I had never met in India a public servant, either a bureaucrat or a politician, who did not ask for a bribe. If you want your water to continue to come, if you want your electricity connection to continue, and if you want your mail to be delivered to you, you must pay bribes. If you don't, your life will come to an end in that country. I was sick and tired of corruption in India. Now, I, of course, don't want to, you to judge India based on what India was like 20 or 30 years back, but at least that is the reason why I left India. I was sick and tired of corruption and dysfunctionality. Now, if Apple had come to me asking me for their advice, I would have said, don't bother. And the reason is, again, very simple. Uh, despite the seemingly seductive uh, market size of the country, which is 1.4 billion people, the problem is that the average GDP of that country is about 2,000 US dollars a year which makes it among the poorest countries on the planet. Now, of course, uh, the way the, the media romanticizes and glamorizes India does not leave you with that feeling, but it is a country that is among the poorest in the world. The market size is very small. Um, so, the um, number of iPhones that will actually get sold in India will be minuscule. But here is another problem. Most of the GDP is actually accruing to a very small minority of Indians. Most Indians actually live a hunger diet. 800 million people must depend on constant supply of grains by the government. Now, this minority, which can actually afford to buy iPhones, that minority isn't going to confess to other Indians that they don't go to London for their weekend shopping. So my view is that uh, the reason Apple opened their shops in India is not to gain more business, but to show to the Wall Street that there's a still growth left in Apple. Virtually every company that I have ever come across that invested in India, a foreign company that invested in India, lost money. And this is for a very simple reason that they think that India is very seductive in terms of the market size, but also when you look at India from afar, you realize that Indian wages are about five to seven dollars a day, even in urban areas. In rural areas, you get away with a lot less. Now imagine paying five dollars a day for a full 12 hour work from people. Uh, without any vacation, without any sick leave, and without any weekends. The cost of labor looks very seductive. The problem is Indian, Indians don't have a work ethic, and Indians are extremely unskilled. That is why when companies come to me about my advice on investing in India, my usual response is, don't bother. Now, something else has happened over the last 30 years. Since globalization started, Indians have started leaving the country. The very best of India, 
it started moving to the US and Canada and London. The technical people, the tradesmen of India, the plumber and the carpenters started moving to the Middle East, to, um, to Malaysia, to Singapore, to Hong Kong, uh, and even to countries like Papua New Guinea. So as time has gone by, the competencies, the average competencies and skill level of Indians have actually gone down, not up. Something else has happened uh, in, the, in the government uh, in India. When I was uh, working in India, uh, of course, every public servant asked for a bribe, but there was usually some shame associated with exchanging bribes. The, you used to use euphemism to, to exchange bribes. Those days have completely changed. Today, bribes are exchanged openly. They are asked for openly. And the quantum of bribes that are asked for has gone up significantly. It was believed earlier that if public servants in India got paid better, they would ask for less bribes. In fact, the exact opposite has happened. Now that they get paid extremely well, the kind of bribes they want is also extremely well. That is why had Apple asked me about India, I would have recommended don't bother. Now, I went to um, a city called Indore, which is today considered to be among the cleanest and best cities in India to do my uh, graduation, my engineering degree. I lived in Indore for five years and uh, once uh, there, are, there are many, many stories I could uh, talk about uh, of uh, Indian environment, Indian ecology. Uh, but let me talk about one story. Um, one day, a few boys from the university decided to visit a prostitute. Uh, the Indian police, the indoor police came to uh, came in, walked in, arrested all of them, took them to the police station. The men were allowed to go home. Uh, their parents had to come the next day to give bribes to the policemen. Uh, now, these men told me the next the, the next day that they went when they went to the police station to sign some forms. The woman was the prostitute was still at the police station and she could not walk. Uh, she had been raped by every single policeman at the police station. Um, uh, when I was in the university again, um, uh, one boy, uh, an underage uh, boy, was sodomized by uh, people in the university. When I went to complain about it to the university and the police, I was told not to bother reporting it. Uh, of course, if I had reported, nothing would have happened, but they clearly told me that if I tried anything, I would suffer. Next morning, the kid, the boy disappeared um, without a trace. Again, I should not be judging India based on what used to happen 30 years back. Uh, so what I want to do now is fast forward to today. Um, as I said, I continue to advise companies on investing in India. But interestingly, despite that I had completely stopped all involvement with India over the last 20 years. Um, I had an occasion to meet some of the top bureaucrats in Madhya Pradesh. Madhya Pradesh is where Indore is uh, uh, very recently. And what I recognized was that the culture of bribes has gone up like the fish is traded in the fish market. It is blatant. And the higher you go, in the hierarchy, the only thing that changes is the quantum of bribe that you must pay. These people openly blackmail you, openly uh, take bribes, and, and have absolutely no understanding of the law. Now, 
Remember what I told you about what happened to the technicians and intelligent people of the country. They left India over the last 30 years. Something similar has happened with the government. Um, because uh, the, the top people have left the country and also because of privatization and globalization, uh, intelligent people can get better paid and have a better life with private companies. They no longer necessarily want to work for the government. So the quality of normal people going, trying to go into the government has deteriorated rapidly. Another thing has happened because of what is now known in the West as uh, diversity inclusion um, policies, uh, something similar has been uh, the case in India where now uh, between 50 to 70 percent of the people who join the government or actually even go to the uh, technical institutes must be from the lower caste, which means that the quality of people joining the government has deteriorated very, very rapidly. I would say that a general employee of the government of India is petty, he's brain dead, and is thoroughly venal. Um, and add all these things together and you realize that the quantum of corruption has actually exploded in that country. It's blatant. It's everywhere. As common as fish is in the fish market. Um, let me take you uh, to two of the recent videos from Madhya Pradesh. And uh, first is a video from uh, an office in Indore. Now, what you saw in the video is exactly the what happens in every single office in India. You must grovel and prostrate in front of these brain dead, petty, venal officers. Without that, nothing happens because remember, everyone pays bribes. So you have to be submissive towards the bureaucrats before your work gets done. Uh, now, the interesting thing here, which is just a bit of digression here is, that part of the reason why diversity and inclusion for the lower caste was adopted in the government, or at least the claimed reason was to, um, uh, uh, to, to bring down caste behavior of Indians. Uh, what you clearly see is that the lower caste people are more caste conscious and more interested in proving that they are of the higher caste compared to other lower caste, that this is the behavior that they, 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 they implement in government offices today. Now these are the now these are the days of trigger warning. So, so I must warn you about the next next video. The next video will leave you extremely unhappy and extremely frustrated uh, because there is a death in that video. But moreover. It will leave you frustrated because you will realize how unnecessary that death was. I will leave that video in loop while I speak because you really have to absorb what is happening in that country. And this video gives you a very good understanding if you pay attention of the economics of India. This is Indore. This is from a temple in Indore, one of the nicest, cleanest, and supposedly the best cities in the country, in the province of Madhya Pradesh, where I said uh, corruption is as common as air is around you, uh, and where the higher you go, the more bribe you must pay. That is the only thing that changes. Mafia runs across the country 
government offices today, they have direct control over what bureaucrats do because the mafia and politicians and bureaucrats are in OG and OG together. What you see in this scene is a, f a, a floor of a temple where uh, many, many people had come to worship. And this floor was actually a roof of a step well, a historical step well. And this concrete that was there was so thin that it gave way. About 40 people fell into the well. Most of them died. There was no rescue effort. Imagine in a city of 3 million people, there was no capability to run a rescue operation. This is a country that claims to compare itself with China. It is absolutely idiotic to do this. Look at what is happening. The ladder is handmade. It is not capable of do, helping you with rescue effort. There's only one person trying to bring people out of the step well and he has no helmet and no shoes. The cord that is being used to bring the woman up is all patchwork of small cords. It, the cord gave way, the knot wasn't made properly. But also remember that there's one guy trying to help out whereas there are about 50 people, 100 people, supposedly fire people, supposedly policemen, supposedly rescue people who are only shouting instructions, creating noise and doing nothing else uh, except creating chaos. That is the crux of the institution in India. A few economic lessons to learn here. There's no organization in that country. Venality, corruption rules the roost in that country. And 100 people do the job of one person and then that job does not get done. It fails. And the woman died. So, so ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude my talk today on the economics of India. What happened was that in 1947, India became so-called independent of the British. Since then, the institutions of India have continued to get hollowed out. Its population has continued to grow because of green revolution and its economy has started to grow about 30 years back because of Western technology. But all those low-hanging fruit have been plucked. India has been stagnating for the last several years now. India is literally falling apart. There is no rule of law in that country. The country is increasingly mafia-run. And the public servants are not only corrupt as they were earlier, but completely shameless so the question is, why did India deteriorate under uh, Indian control? Uh, and here is the real problem. Uh, something that people who grow up in the West fail to recognize. Indians don't have moral consciousness. Expediency and might is right is the, are the driving forces in India. The institutions had to fall away because there's no concept of righteousness, no concept of moral behavior in that country. If you are corrupt and if you get away with that, you are actually respected. As time goes by, contrary to the perception or claimed perception of Western bureaucrats and media that I showed you earlier, India is actually falling apart, it will degenerate and will become one big chaos over the next few years. And I haven't even mentioned the increasing Hindu fanaticism that is happening in the country. What should you expect? There are going to be more and more cultural influence coming to, the, to Canada from India. Uh, so you should be aware of it. Please just watch the video that I showed you. Keep that in your memory. 
to understand and remind yourself of the economics of India, how unskilled, how wasteful uh, that country is. And there's nothing to improve on that situation. I know it frustrates you no end. It frustrates me, no, used to frustrate me no end. Uh, but you must come to a realization that nothing can be changed about this. Things in India, the situation in India will continue to deteriorate. Brave, courageous claims by Rina, Gina Raimondo, CNN, Farid Zakaria isn't going to make a dent to what is going to happen in that country. Thank you very much and enjoy the day.